I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Brent Zjarnik, Associate Professor of the Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base. Brent's past roles include work with the New Mexico Spaceport Authority and Air Force Reserve, with a focus on management and leadership for space assets. Brent's the author of three books, including Developing National Space Power, To Rule the Skies, and 21st Century Power, which was awarded the best air power history book of 2021 by the Air Force Historical Society. Brent's also been published in Wired, Politico, and The Hill, among other popular media venues. Brent has a PhD in military strategy from Air University, a PhD in economic development from New Mexico State University, a master's in military strategy from the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, Master's in Military Operational Art and Science from the United States Air Force Air Command and Staff College, an ME from the University of Colorado, and a Bachelor's in Space Operations from the Air Force Academy. So Brent, welcome back, sir. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Today is, this is going to be really exciting. We're talking about UFO research that you did in the Air Force archives, and I'm going off of notes that you've sent me. So let me start out by asking what originally inspired you to undertake this research? <laughs> uh, well, like all interesting research projects, uh, completely by accident. Um, you know, being a professor at uh, Staff College, we're supposed to write on air power issues and stuff as we go uh, along as part of our duties. And one day I was in the archives, uh, which are which are great, and was looking at uh, things regarding uh, Pan Am in the 30s and 40s to see how, you know, uh, to try to look at uh, issues for, you know, public-private partnerships in the development of air power to try to get some ideas for space power. And I happened to just uh, see in one of the boxes, you know, uh, um, an Air Defense Command, a U.S. Air Force Air Defense Command briefing from the 50s. It was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. I'll look through that. And, uh, and then oddly enough, found a UFO slide in it. And I'm like, whoa. I never knew that Air Defense Command was really interested in this stuff. And uh, I looked into it a little bit more and found a little bit more and then decided, you know what, I should really start to get good at the uh, the UFO books from the 50s because there is something there, uh, at least Air Force interest there. And that's how it started, uh, looking at Air Defense Command uh, material. Um, and then after I did that for a little while, uh, you know, um, this is about the time, probably about two years ago now, where, uh, you know, the UFO or UAP issue in D.C. was going on. And uh, I heard on the radio, just going into work one day as a reserve officer, uh, you know, former Senator Harry Reid say, oh, yeah, we have uh, information that UFOs tried to, you know, shut down our missile silos. And I was like, whoa, that is an unbelievably, you know, uh, uh, bad statement to say. I mean, that's just irresponsible because that's something that can be easily disproven. And, you know, I, I tend to like UFO stuff anyway, but I thought that was just, wow, I can't believe someone said that. And I went in and talked to my squadron commander who served at, you know, um, Malmstrom Air Force Base uh, back in the day. And it's like, can you believe this guy would say that? Um, and I explained it to him. He's like, oh yeah, that happened. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and then we went into it and he was like, yeah, there was an old guy that was there forever. And uh, he would tell us stories like this. And, um, you know, it's yeah, that that was definitely a thing. And then I was like, well, I really need to go into the archives again. And that's when I started doing missile stuff. So, oh, um, OK, well, and you actually have the slide. So w without any further ado, uh, wh why don't we put that up? And you could just you could just show us briefly the slide that kind of got you started with this. Hopefully you're seeing that now, but this is a really bad microfilm version of a slide from uh, U.S. Air Force Air Defense Command 1955, where they did, uh, you know, put a PowerPoint slide up regarding uh, what different unidentified flying objects were reported by military people uh, during the quarter. And now, granted, this was a secret um, back in the 50s. It's now declassified, so I'm not talking out of school. Uh, you know, this was a secret briefing back in the day, but if you take a look at the slide, it's actually confidential, which is one level below mm, uh, secret. Okay. But um, yeah, these were being briefed to, uh, you know, higher headquarters and general officers on a on a daily basis. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. 
what is a UFO be? <laughs> you know, and um, uh, it was just seeing that one time and then looking more into it. Uh, you see that the Air Force really did have stuff on uh, on UFOs and they're sprinkled throughout a lot of different areas. So uh, I guess I can stop sharing that because that's all I really could find that might be interesting to your viewers. Well, but, no, um, I, I think it's important. It's important to highlight that also that this issue goes back a long ways and the 1950s was giant for ufos right i mean i think most people are familiar with ufos over washington dc right that was mm -hmm. big as well and mm -hmm. and so uh, you know I, I think it's just so important to remind people um that this is not a new issue right it doesn't start with the nimitz so oh no oh no uh, you know, some people think, uh, seem to think that because the UAPs, you know, that's the new the new term that everyone likes. Uh, you know, that started in 2003, and and UAPs are real uh, or real issues, and UFOs weren't. People don't realize that UFO was created um, by the Air Force. Uh, you know, Captain Ed Ruppelt uh, to uh, to try to put to bed the you know the tainted reference of flying saucer. You know, and then you know, 70 years later, people don't like UFO anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We keep changing the name, but it's the same phenomena. So, well, so if I understand things correctly, you wanted to correlate what was written in a few popular books on UFOs. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these books. These are the better ones, right? Because again, there are thousands of books out there. Many of them are incredibly subjective. Um, but you worked from reports in Captain Ed Repelt's report on unidentified objects. Uh, some of J. Allen Hynek's books, uh, Robert Hastings' UFOs and Nukes, and then mm -hmm. Robert Salas' Faded Giant book. And so uh, if I understand this correctly, what you did was basically pull Air Force unit histories from the Air Force Historical Research Agency, right? Yes. Um, I would like to add one book uh, that I thought was really interesting that I never would have uh, looked at before, and that's Mystery Stocks the Prairie by uh, Keith Wolverton. And that was a lot about, uh, oddly enough, cattle mutilations in the 70s. But mm. it had a lot of military stuff in there because uh, the same activity was taking place at, again, missile silos. So uh, it's uh, I would like to add that because I thought that was really interesting as well. Uh, but yes, at the uh, AFHRA, uh, it's the repository for unit histories. And unit histories often have a narrative which, you know, base historians sort of put together to just try to explain what's happened during, you know, the year. And a lot of the narratives are very dry and not very useful. Well, I mean, they're useful enough for, for normal uh, operations, but they don't really say, hey, and then this weird thing happened on December 15th or whatever. Uh, but they also have a large number of, they call them exhibits that are uh, primary source documents. And uh, that's the really fun part to flip through them. Um, and that's pretty much what I did. Um, so, you know, the uh, the problem is, is that, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, the story is in the top secret archives or the secret archives. And, you know, I looked into it and honestly, most of the things that I found uh, almost, almost without, uh, you know, uh, fail, if I ever saw anything about uh, that would indicate something about UFOs, it was already declassified and it would it had already been sent to someone back in 72 or, you know, 83. Mm, um, OK, which, which was interesting. Uh, yeah. Not everything, but 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 quite a bit. Well, so let me let me touch on uh, the, the top secret aspect of this. You were able to review top secret histories for SAC and the missile wings and some secret histories for Air Defense Command and the Rendlesham unit, as well as some helicopter units from the missile fields. So I guess one of the things that I want to ensure is that nothing that we're talking about today violates national security. I don't want to cause trouble for you. I don't want to cause trouble for anyone. And yet, and yet it's, it's so valuable to be able to look at, I guess, um, you know, the, the, what would you call it, the unredacted versions of this, which you've done. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, I'm not talking anything that's that's currently uh, classified because that's, you know, you're not supposed to do that. And there's, yeah. you know, not a not a whole lot of benefit to it anyway. Uh, but what I found is that a lot of the stuff that was there was uh, was was declassified already. And honestly, afterwards, I actually found on the Internet some of the more interesting uh, 
uh, you know, UFO repository sites that are civilian oriented. And that was my big takeaway. It's uh, was, you know, the UF ufologists, if you want to use that term from the 50s and 60s and 70s and people that have been come going through archives and stuff like that have actually done a fairly good job documenting, uh, you know, uh, primary sources, tracking down the people that were there. Um, if there's a fault anywhere, it's that they take all this stuff and and then run with it, you know, in a very subjective manner to say, well, hey, this is proof that all of this stuff is happening. I don't think they quite get that far, but you can't just um, ignore them or dismiss them because they were going to levels of military history quality that would be pretty much, you know, uh, respected in the military community. You know, they were they were doing good research, doing finding the right people, and most of the things they report on uh, were, you know, are, are defendable. You know, uh, they really talk to the people that were really there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the big reveal that you had for me is that you found no smoking guns and really no new information, even at the top secret level. So that's a strange reveal. The reveal is there's no reveal. But I think it's also incredibly important to, you know, get that out there that, um, you know, like, well, so I, I, I guess the thing that comes to mind for me is this. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA 2023, um, has been tasked with looking at these records back to 1945, right? And they definitely have a wider scope. They're not just looking at Air Force. They're going to be looking at all branches of the military, presumably, as well as uh, who knows what else. So they, they've got a wider scope of documents to work with. But in terms of this Air Force stuff, you were able to look at a lot of really big cases and you didn't find new information. And so I think that this is incredibly relevant today. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, I think so in order to get the entire story, uh, because, um, you know, UFOs aren't necessarily just hey it's either nothing is happening or it's an alien invasion <laughs> right um and most of the early ufologists didn't necessarily think that they were just trying to report what what they were seeing and sure some people you know came to their own conclusions and those conclusions are debatable but their research skills you know generally weren't um but uh, i think having returning back to the the 50s 60s uh you know sort of neutrality on conclusions is a, is a big deal and I would like to think that uh, the new group that's studying this stuff and looking at the historical records and everything uh, th uh, today would look at the old, you know, ufologists. I think Hynek's work was really well done. And what people don't realize is that, you know, J. Allen Hynek, the guy that was sort of the chief scientist for Project Blue Book in the 60s and 70s, he single handedly developed how, you know, today's Space Force tracks satellites in space. I mean, he was a brilliant physicist that should be considered, you know, one of the great, you know, uh, space power technology leaders. But, you know, it's like, hey, Heineck should be respected by the Space Force. The Space Force is like, oh, man, isn't that the like the UFO guy? <laughs> you know, but um, so there's a lot of uh, biases, you know, pro and, and con, depending on where you are. But uh, if they come, the new bunch comes to uh, you know, being neutral, hey, this is just the facts as they were reported. You know, we can't verify whether they're accurate or not regarding conclusions, but good people saw very interesting things and just came out with, you know, um, hey, this is what we know. Because I, I tend to suspect after going through a lot of this that, uh, you know, as, as sad as it is to say, uh, discussions at the secret or top secret level regarding UAP or whatever you're talking about don't really rise any higher up in quality than uh, than two guys discussing it after work at a bar. Uh, why? Because even though we um, government people might have data that's considered classified, it's no more conclusive than anything else. And you know, some people would say, "Well, hey, then give us all the the information." Well, you can't do that because you've got sources and methods and other things that you have to worry about, and that sort of breeds conspiracy. But um, you know, uh, I hope that that they can be a little bit more uh, honest because I'm sure that the people that are looking at UAPs now and the government are trying to be honest, 
But I've also heard rumors that the report that was delivered, you know, about a year ago now regarding um, the report on UAPs uh, was intended to be a good deal larger than it was, um, you know, with actual case studies and stuff like that. But ultimately it was redacted or, you know, uh, entire parts of it were rejected for for classification issues. And that is not because they're trying to hide something. It's because in the military, you know, uh, industrial government sort of uh, sort of sector, it's easier to say no than to say yes. Yeah. Because if they hide something, all you're going to do is take some flack from the from the, you know, the UFO community. Right. But if you say yes and there's something in there that the, you know, an adversary can use, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, you might have harmed national security. Uh, I think that argument is overblown, but um, in the government, you know, uh, it doesn't hurt to say no. It can hurt a lot to say yes. Well, um, it, you know, I I, I want to qualify what my, you know, what I, my earlier statement about a big reveal also. Not finding new information is not the same thing as not having information. There are mountains and mountains of information on this topic, right? And so... In, in a strange way, I think the big reveal, it sounds like you were able to confirm a lot of the stuff that's out there, right? I mean, so if people are, if they're, if they're reading, like, uh, one of the big ones for me was Robert Hastings' UFOs and Nukes. If people are following that book, you would say for the most part, they could use that as verifiable information, right? Yes. As far as the stories and the difference, uh, the different things that were going on there, uh, yeah, I Whenever I would look at a specific time, um, mo most of the time they didn't say anything because it's like, hey, it's just one guy on his midnight shift saw a, a bright light in the sky isn't going to rise to, you know, a, uh, um, uh, you know, the official history. But especially in Faded Giant with Robert Solis and uh, I think it's James Klotz, uh, you know, they tell a pretty you know, remarkable story. And then they go back. Uh, one thing struck me in particular. Uh, you know, this was in the 90s when they wrote this. So a lot of the people were still alive. You know, unfortunately, in the 2020s, that's not the case anymore. But uh, they reached back and went to the uh, the actual historian because they even have the the, you know, the uh, the narrative from the uh, from the archive printed in their book because they got it declassified in the 90s. And uh, it's it says very clearly, like uh, people were talked, you know, people in the field were talked to and they had no information on ufos or something like that so they tried to dismiss the story and the uh they got in touch with the the historian that wrote that narrative and he i could tell he is a great base historian because his history was that thick on his wing everyone else's wings were like that so he took his craft seriously they've they've reached out to him in the late 80s or 90s and he's like oh yeah they stonewalled me like mad <laughs> you know they took out everything regarding that because i know that uh, they were reporting this stuff and I couldn't write about it in the history. And it's like, Ooh, I definitely believe that guy. Um, okay. Now is that evidence of a huge conspiracy or is it evidence of, you know, some Colonel on staff, like, look, man, you're going to totally blow this out of proportion. We're going to be working on this for months. Just let yeah. it go. You know, uh, and, and either one is plausible. One is more plausible. Like, dude, leave the ufo stuff alone can't we just get back on the business <laughs> you know but that's not 100 percent guarantee well and I, I think that's also important to point out right is that ufos these events are exceptions to normal operations you know and i mean the, the military has a real job to do and that's not saying that ufos aren't important but it's saying that you know when your plate is already full with stuff that you have to get done and it's it, you know a lot of it's like life or death right this is mission critical stuff um when you're already in that position these unexpected events people can't explain them they have no idea what's going on it comes and goes it, it's easy for it to get swept under the rug because nobody wants to deal with it right true true and i think that still happens um to this day yeah uh, not because of any huge you know conspiracy it's just like look man you know i'm just trying to make the next rank and get home at you know 5 30 tonight not you know 2 30 in the morning because someone's mad that i sent you know a telex or you know an email so it's uh it's interesting but uh you know it's it's the way human beings are right 
Yeah. Well, to go back to Robert Hastings' book, one of the things that interested me about that, I ended up there because I had seen a correlation between UFO reports and our, our entire nuclear supply chain, right? And in fact, that the more that I dug into that and I started following up on reports, it wasn't just nuclear weapons, you know? And that's something that people have talked about. Like Jacques Vallée just published a book called Trinity. I believe uh, he was talking about uh, a UFO sighting at the Trinity test site. Um, there have been lots of reports about, uh, you know, uh, nuclear missile tests with UFO sightings associated with them. Um, Obviously, Roswell, you know, uh, Rendlesham Forest, those were both, uh, you know, nuclear armed facilities, if I remember right. Um, so there's, there's this correlation there. But when I started to go through Hastings' book, it's a correlation that goes to production facilities, right? Like, in fact, one of the first, if not the first UFO sighting was over Hanford in 1945, where they were producing, they were producing the weapons grade uh, nuclear materials. So you know, it's, it's this entire supply chain. Um, is, is that something that your research supported in any way? And do you have any thoughts about what that might mean? Um, I, you know, I, uh, it's that you run into a, an interesting, uh, issue of, uh, sensor bias. Um, you know, that's a thing that's been talked about around the UAPs a lot. It's like, wow, it seems like these UAPs are found an awful lot on our test ranges and, you know, where we do a lot of military flying. I was like, well, that might be true, but, you know, it's also the only place we have really good radar, uh, you know, uh, coverage over the United States. And you have a whole bunch of fighter pilots that are trying to find things out in the sky and then see odd things. So is it that whatever these things are, if they are there, are there specifically to, you know, for a particular reason, or it's just people happen to be there that are, that are seeing them more often because that's where we're looking. I'm a, f I am can't prove this or, you know, suggest this one way or the other, but um, it seemed like there was a, 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 an evolution of UFOs or UIPs in the air force where, you know, you, you hear about the Foo Fighters in the forties, you know, because there were bomber crews over Europe and stuff like that. There was a lot of flying. Uh, then you sort of enter the realm of the interceptors where, you know, uh, air defense command was sending up, F-86s, F-94s to scramble on, you know, tracks that they didn't understand. And some of them turned out to be, you know, uh, people saw weird lights or odd, you know, flight characteristics and stuff like that. And then the interceptors sort of stop, you know, sort of die down in the, in the sixties. And then you start going to the missile fields. Um, and then I wonder if that's not sensor bias as well, because why would you see an awful lot of weird things at missile silos? Quite honestly, because there's a lot of people that are up in the middle of the night, two in the morning, three in the morning at missile silos and can look out their window, <laughs> yeah. you know. So there was a lot of people, um, you know, uh, watching these things because there were security forces that were out there guarding those positions at night. And there were uh, maintainers, maintenance people that were out there working at night. And then you've got the crews, like the captains and the lieutenants and the officers they're buried underground in a capsule where they cannot see anything. They cannot hear anything. They simply have a phone. And when you're starting to, you know, when you talk in that kind of situation, communication can get really weird, really quick. So, uh, but there's the narrative, right? It's like, okay, if you assume that, uh, that UFOs are here, then you start asking, well, why are they here now when they weren't here later? Well, it might be because of nuclear weapons, because we can sort of blow up the world now. So you think that, hey, if aliens were here or UFOs or whatever you want to call them, uh, where would they be interested in? Well, our our biggest weapons, which just happen to be the missiles, right? Or, you know, uh, the nuclear production facilities and stuff like that. So um, I tend to think that maybe... Uh, it it might be a little sensor bias because, you know, you don't have airmen out at four in the morning trying to track down what every uh, weird light in the sky tends to be everywhere in the world, just in the missile fields. But then again, it follows the narrative that if someone was interested in us, where would they be interested? It's like, well, we'd be interested in whether those, uh, those things over there could, could hit us with those lunatic weapons they're building. So it's, it's hard to say, uh, what I think would be awesome is if the military people got together 
at least a little bit with some of the civilian UFO people. And yeah, some of them are a little bit out of, uh, you know, maybe a little bit too into the conspiracy theory stuff, but other people have good information to try to get a holistic understanding of where and why and, you know, how people yeah. see strange things to see if there isn't a sensor bias, you know, um, but, you know, that that requires money. And, you know, as much as we give a lot of money to the DOD, there's always something else they could be spending their money on. Well, and, and that's a good point. But, yeah, I, I would love to see more military collaboration with the general public. Right. And maybe that's something that Arrow could undertake, you know, as things progress. Maybe there is a way that they could put together kind of a joint public uh, government participation project. And this actually goes to something I was going to mention later, but I think, I, I, I'm sure you would probably agree in some ways, there is a developing trust gap and it's been growing over time, right? And as, as UFOs, um, you know, again, there's been a lot of stonewalling. There's the issue of classification. Um, that has been ongoing from the military side of things. UFO culture continues to evolve. These stories continue to pile up and it seems like um, they build on themselves, right? So a lot of things that start out a little odd get stranger and stranger over time and it's hard to verify or dismiss things. And so I think that that's led to kind of a trust gap, right? Because people who tend to believe in UFOs who say, okay, well, this is, you know, this is a real phenomena or, you know, maybe, maybe more, maybe they're like, these are extraterrestrial, you know, whatever, whatever they tend to support. They see what the government is saying and they're like, okay, they're lying. They're stonewalling, you know? So, so any kind of a public, you know, a community collaborative effort like that seems like it would go a long way in bridging the gap. I, I would agree. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, uh, I really do. I, I grew up in the the nineties. That's when I was in high school. Right. And, uh, I saw, you know, the show X Files was the big one, you know, yeah. but even before that was, there was a show called sightings, which I remember it was sort of like unsolved mysteries. Only they only talked about UFOs and ghosts. It was great. Um, but if you really want the conspiracy theory, uh, folks going nuts, uh, do you remember that old Fox television show sightings? I vaguely remember sightings and then X Files and, uh, you know, there were a few classics. I, Independence Day was my favorite from the 90s, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Where's oh, yeah. Will Smith punched down an alien? Welcome to Earth. I'm like, yep. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, everyone wanted to be a fighter pilot after that, especially folks at the Air Force Academy like me. But um, I to come back to sightings, uh, I remember very clearly there was a guy, the, uh, the host was a guy named Tim White. Um, later on, I found out that he was no joke a, uh, a brigadier general in the Air Force Reserve. <laughs> So, so what's the Air Force trying to hide? I don't know, sir. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> you know, one of the things I wanted to ask about was Roswell. I have to ask about Roswell or else the audience will yell at me. Did you find any reference, any anything there, I guess? You know, oddly enough, I didn't really look at Roswell. Um, and uh, there's the reason for that is that Roswell didn't seem to get really big until the 90s. And... Uh, you know, I sort of just kept the uh, my reading to, um, you know, the the stuff in the 70s and the 50s in uh, Hastings book. Um, so uh, it, it just sort of oddly never came up. And I, I honestly didn't think about it, um, except for the only thing that I can add about uh, Roswell is when I was doing research on my book on, you know, General Tommy Power, uh, I found out that uh, General Ramey, after who was the commander of the base at, um, I think he was commander of the base, but he was involved in in Roswell. I think it was, I, oh man, I can't remember now. But anyway, he was he was involved in that, and apparently all the other general officers in the Air Force sent him uh, sort of ridiculing messages, laughing about him because he showed up in a political cartoon, and he was furious, <laughs> and all the generals were just laughing at him about it. So, uh, you know, does that mean anything? I don't know, but it, it sort of, it's, it humanizes the people that were there. Um, you know, so I can't really add much to that. Uh, and, and indeed I can't really add a whole lot to other things except for, you know, confirming or, or, you know, finding out about different things like in Rendlesham forest, for instance, uh, you know, Colonel Halt was absolutely, you know, there, the other people were there, um, 
But uh, some people started claiming that there were a uh, an uptick in suicides at the base after this incident. And looking through the records, the records are very difficult to, uh, you know, um, to falsify. There were no uh, suicides at the base after that that were out of the ordinary. I can't remember. Maybe there was one or there were maybe one or two, but it was normal for the base. So but that just shows, you know, shows you that it's very easy to start to embellish you know, um, the, uh, the story as things go. And, you know, maybe that's why, you know, why archive dumpster divers like me might be relatively important, uh, you know, and by relatively, I mean, not, but, <laughs> but, you know, maybe we can, we can do some uh, of some use. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think what you're doing is incredibly valuable. I think it's incredibly valuable. It helps confirm a lot of these reports. And I think one of the one of the other things that you found, you mentioned this in, in your notes, was uh, there was a story about an ICBM being almost activated or activated by UFO. And from your research, that did not happen. I, I think you'd said that they were reporting faulty electronics, and this was an ongoing issue that they then attributed to the UFO, but it had nothing to do with it, if I understand. Well, yeah, that's that, I'm glad you brought that up because it's an interesting story. That might be the one thing that I can say that I can hang my hat on a little bit um, is that, uh, you know, in uh, Hastings book, and he also has a good article um, that's online. You can find it called Remarkable Reports from the Missile Field that has a lot of the juiciest, you know, things from his book. One of them was... Uh, a missileer talked to, uh, you know, got in contact with him through, um, you know, his research in the eighties about a time where he argues this, this missileer says that, um, there was a light reported over our missile silos. And then all of a sudden our electronics came on and said there was a launch in progress. Uh, that would be extraordinarily frightening. <laughs> right. Um, and then they, he said that the, the UFO went away and then the, uh, you know, they had to, put, you know, push the inhibit switch to make sure they didn't launch and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, that really, even if that's not, you know, uh, uh, you know, a UFO sort of thing, that would be a reportable issue is if someone said, Hey, our electronics freaked out like that. And I found, um, and I, I couldn't get all of it declassified because it's sensitive technical information, which is the, the hardest stuff with nuclear weapons. But, um, it was pretty clear that uh, um, through the reporting, especially in the SAC, uh, hit, you know, history, that um, this was a known issue. Um, and it happened so often that uh, SAC headquarters essentially said, look, stop giving us this detailed report every time it happened. It happened maybe 120 times over the span of a couple of months. And it was a known issue for this one type of missile. Um, and But... You know, there were hundreds of crews in the missile fields at this point, and there was never, you know, maybe people were being trained on this, that, hey, this happens. If this if this happens, you have to, you know, take care of it this way. And maybe this this poor guy had no idea what was going on. And, um, you know, when he thinks about it later, he correlates different issues saying that, hey, well, obviously it has to be this. Um, so it it points out two things to me. One the people that report these wild things uh, aren't lying. You know, something did happen to them because it does what the report that SAC was saying is happening was exactly like almost word for word what this guy says, um, you know, happened to him. But then again, it's like, well, that's not it doesn't necessarily need to have a UFO, uh, you know, or extraterrestrial, uh, you know, interference uh, response. Because SAC seemed to think that it was just, you know, a an electrical issue that it was eventually taken care of. It was fixed. Um, and then one of my students, when I was explaining this story, it's like, hey, this is why military history and UFO, you know, you need to, you you know, this is, these are interesting stories. It's like, well, yeah, but, you know, uh, the student was saying, hey, did you ever like correlate whether there were UFO reports on all the other times this happened? And I'm like, oh, don't even get into that. <laughs> you know, um, where, uh, you know, everyone, SAC would seem to think this is just an electronics issue, but really it was just, you know, uh, you know, the UFOs were still messing with it. They just, no one else reported it that way. Like, ugh, I don't know. But it's it's one of those things that you can't just dismiss things happening because they have factual bases behind them, uh, whether that can support extraterrestrial, 
you know, interference is totally um, a different issue, you know? Yeah. So, so that's why I like to say it. It's like UFOs are military history because real military people took real actions and reported real things from real things, you know, real events that they experienced. That does not necessarily lead to, you know, uh, well, aliens are among us and they're messing with our military. Uh, that is, you know, a, a an explanation, but it's still an open explanation. Well, yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that's a whole nother bag of worms, but um, you know, from reading through all of these reports and I guess we're, we're just going completely the realm of the speculative, but uh, you know, the, the performance characteristics and the way that these things are described doesn't appear to be any kind of an aircraft that a foreign power might have. And when you turn back the clock to the 1950s, right? I mean, I don't see how Russia could have built something like that. And the Chinese were nowhere even in the ballpark for anything like that back then right and and so it does open a lot of questions i mean do you have any personal thoughts or opinions on it or are you staying out of that for the time being well it's it's still you know i uh, it's it's amazing how you know uh what's old was new again but uh, a lot of the discussions that they're having now with the uaps were almost exactly the same discussions they were having in the 50s uh, you're right. These reports of things doing incredible things, uh, you can take them one of one of two different ways. It's like that was really happening. And if that's the case, what the heck was it? You know, or it was people were misunderstanding, um, you know, phenomenon based off of, you know, their uh, either um, bad equipment or, you know, not familiar, not familiar with the equipment or, or something like that. So there were only two real possibilities. One, it was happening, or two, it wasn't happening. It just looked like it was from people that misinterpreted something else. Uh, that's exactly what's happening now. You know, it's, uh, hey, we have pilots reporting this, and it's on, you know, uh, we have, you know, FLIR video ab about the Tic Tacs and stuff like that. Um I asked one of my students who was an F-15 pilot. It's like, hey, what do you think of this stuff? He's like, hey, I, he was dismissive of the whole thing. He's like, look, uh, FLIR looks, things on forward looking infrared look really weird. And that's not out of the ordinary, you know? So uh, again, um, if these things are actually happening, it would indicate that there's something really strange going on. Yeah. Um, but the the big the big question is, you know, are we just misinterpreting things and is our sensor data as good as we think it is? Well, and again, you know, who knows? Well, and that's yeah. And and that's I mean, that's really that goes to the heart of what's being investigated in D.C. right now. Um, now, so one thing I do want to ask also, and again, the, the audience will kill me if I don't ask this. A lot of people would say, well, of course, you're not going to find records in the classified archives because it was moved out to private industry, right? And, you know, the, the conspiratorial uh, folks would say this was moved out of the, the government part so that investigations couldn't find it. Um, did, did you see any indications of like crash recovery or private corporations evolved or anything along those lines? Uh, not in the archives. Um, you know, oddly enough, I wouldn't even know how to... Uh how to how to begin researching that kind of stuff it would have to take a specific mention of a specific project or something like that with a real date uh but but then again that's when you get into the uh the uh like the ufology part of it um you know i uh it was a philip corso i think wrote the day after roswell where he's like uh he gave the best <laughs> the best explanation that i ever heard of of something that i would consider extremely plausible in the military which is hey yeah you know, something crashed at Roswell. We were scared for a while, but they didn't seem to come back. And now we just have all this wreckage that we just don't know what to do with. So, you know, the guy retired that knew what to do with it. And they never gave it back or, you know, they never filled his uh, custodian role with someone else. So it's just been rotting in a corner for 20 years. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. actually, you were not the only military officer who has said that about the Corso book. I, I've heard that Corso, uh, in terms of the the way that the military works, or at least used to work, um, it, it, I, what would the, the way to describe it be? Um, the, the military tends to have poor institutional memory, 
or at least in terms of UFO stuff, right? And so I think for most people, this this notion that, well, maybe we, you know, maybe we got a flying saucer, maybe one crashed and we got it, but we forgot that we have it. You know, most people would be like, well, there's no way that you could forget that you have a UFO. I, I think I think that the military very well could. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it, it's like you can ask me, it's like, well, did did Roswell happen the way the ufologists say it did? It's like, you know, I don't know. It depends on how I, you know, what what side of the bed I get up in the morning. But I tell you, if it did happen, I'm willing to bet it went down exactly like Corso said. <laughs> but, um. You know, uh, it's but it's one of those things. And then you've got uh, what Tom DeLong, who who wrote some of those. Uh, I, I think I listened to a book on tape um, where he's like, yeah, I went to the the public sector or I uh, went to the private sector because people can't get to, uh, you know, uh, uh, private sector stuff or, um, yeah. you know, what do yeah. they call it? Or, you know, uh, it, yeah. It's just even as a as a historian, um, you know, I can get on a government. I can really make a good argument to, for anything top secret. Hey, we need to have this declassified because of this and this and this. And someone will listen to me and say, yay or nay. The one thing that I cannot get is proprietary information, corporate proprietary information, even for corporations that haven't existed since 63. <laughs> you know, um, because why? No one knows how to do it. So. Uh, you know, is that possible? Uh, it's possible. Um, but it also seems that kind of thinking sort of rose with the X-Files and uh, sort of the conspiracy minded folks in the 90s. I I have not seen anything like that. I, I do not know. Um, but uh, it makes for interesting bedtime reading. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I don't I don't know one way or the other. Sorry. No, that's Brent. That's absolutely absolutely wonderful well so let me close today by thanking you so much for your time and i i, I want to thank you for your career of service as well i always thank people for their career of service because i think that's so important you know i mean not just for everything that you've done for the country but to remind people that military personnel are out there defending the country every single day so thank you for that let me close by asking um what do you think we may see as this year moves forward? I mean, as someone who's followed this, who has done research on this, uh, you know, this uh, the UAP topic continues to make headlines. And presumably, as reports are due later in the year, we'll see more headlines. Um, do you have any thoughts on what we might see for the remainder of 2023? Uh, well, not to put a, a damper on anybody, um, you know, I tend to think that the people that are doing the UAP stuff right now are well-meaning people and are really trying to push, uh, you know, uh, to to get out there and do a good job on what Congress told them uh, uh, to do. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, it's questionable whether they're going to be successful or not. Uh, what I would like to see is people just come out and say, hey, look, yeah. You know, um, people claim that they've seen a lot of interesting things. We trust them with nuclear weapons. We trust them with fifth generation fighters. We trust them with millions of dollars and thousands of lives. And they're saying they see this stuff. It, you know, and we're looking into it, but we don't really have, you know, any, any answers, you know, uh, uh, but we need to continue to look and believe me, we're, we're trying to support the public, you know, uh, on this and to say that hey look we're trying to be partners here you know um the uh and and i think people do want to get to the bottom of it even though there may well not be a bottom to get to you know uh again all the things that i've seen there's a lot of questions not a whole lot of answers and there's a very plausible explanation of people are just seeing things that don't exist and are interpreting them wrong but there's an awful lot of people that are doing <laughs> that are doing that if that's the yeah. case um, so I think an honest and open, just like, Hey, we're as baffled as you are, but by God, we're going to try to get to the bottom of this. And you're going to know if we do, uh, would be great. Um, I'm afraid that people above them, uh, you know, as soon as you get the bureaucracy sicked on somebody, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. We can't talk about this event because this radar saw it. And if we put up the screen from, you know, the radar or explain anything, some guy in Russia is going to figure out what we can and what we cannot see with that radar. Therefore, it's classified. Therefore, we can't approach it. Um, I'm afraid it, it's going to get 
you know, nickeled and dimed uh, like that until it's just another 20 page report of, yeah, people say they see things and, you know, but no, no defense significance. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but that's been the case since the fifties. And what I want to say too, is that even in the military, there were people uh, in Ruppelt's book, the report on identified flying objects was, was great about this. It's like people in the fifties were like, look, we're seeing a lot of weird things. We have to send up planes with cameras and we have to figure out what the heck these things are. And then there's other people, you know, saying, ah, oh, this is ridiculous. You guys are just seeing things. And, and then who gets, you know, who gets the money? Uh, you know, um, and, uh, are you going to be the one that signs off this report saying that, uh, yeah, there might be something to this and you're going to get ridiculed by all your buddies and you're never going to make, you know, Colonel or general or, you know, assistant secretary or whatever you're looking for. Uh, I, so I think the, uh, the, the issues that we've had with the, with the UFO uh, situation in the past of a lot of, you know, overly conspiratorial people and then overly skeptical people are still around and those forces might, you know, rip apart a, you know, an unbiased, uh, you know, above board, uh, good faith look into UFOs or UIP or whatever you want to say. Uh, the, it doesn't seem the government is being particularly open. That That's not saying they're being, you know, closed. But if someone can say, hey, look, uh, we're going to take this report down from like 150 pages to 20, uh, there's no reason they're not going to do it again, you know, yeah. or try it. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, I don't think that disclosure is going to happen either. Uh, you know, like some of the people in the UFO community with like, it's just around the corner. They're going to say all this stuff is real. I don't think so, because I don't think they can say that with certainty. Um but then again, everyone's, I'm willing to be surprised, but I'm, I'm, I'm also wouldn't be surprised if when I'm 90, you know, in 2050 and we've got, uh, you know, Martian colonies and lunar colonies and all that kind of stuff, uh, there's still going to be people saying, I could have sworn I saw that spaceship just over that crater over there, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, this might be just a perennial thing that we always deal with. You know, there's always going to be a dragon on the other side of the map. Um, yeah. Uh, but but again, that's that that's my understanding. Just be uh, be prepared to uh, for business as usual. Well, Brent, on that note, thank you again so much for your time today. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.